All right, so here we are, lesson number two in this series, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. Um, let's begin with a bit of a review of the things that we've talked about so far uh, in our introductory lesson. Uh, we said that Thessalonica was an important uh, port city in Macedonia. It was a cosmopolitan city, it was wealthy, uh, also very, very worldly. We also learned that Paul the Apostle established the church here in 51 AD when he spent approximately a month uh, preaching in the local synagogue. Uh, we learned that he was uh, run out of town uh, by Jewish leaders and eventually he made his way to Corinth, which was in the southern part of Greece. After receiving a report from Timothy concerning the progress and the problems that they were having uh, since his uh, departure, they were having in Thessalonica, in that city, uh, he writes two letters to this young church in order to accomplish certain things. First of all, he expresses his joy at their faithfulness. Secondly, he defended his conduct while he was among them. He encourages them and he also gives them more teaching on specific matters. So we're studying these two epistles so that uh, very much like the Thessalonians, we too can understand more about the second coming of Jesus and be prepared for it. Okay, so there's a, a bit of a summary of some of the things that we talked about last week. Today, uh, we're going to get into the actual text, so open your Bibles to um, the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Now, the first section of this epistle is uh, what we call the salutation and it is contained in the very first verse. So let's uh, read that, shall we? Uh, Paul says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now, I want you to note that as an apostle, Peter puts his name first, and then Silvanus, which was the Roman name of Silas, Right? We knew that he traveled with Silas, Silvanus was his Roman name, um, and uh, Silas or Silvanus is mentioned second because he was chosen to accompany Paul on this second missionary journey once uh, Barnabas and Mark uh, went their own way to do their work in, on the island of Cyprus. And then Timothy is last because, well, he's the, he's the newbie, he's the youngest one of the group. Now, Paul refers to them as the church, or the called out among the Thessalonians. Uh, they were called to come out from the people of Thessalonica to be with God through Jesus Christ. That's what the term church means, the original Greek word, ecclesia. Actually, in the beginning, that word um, referred to the city elders. Uh, they were the ones who were called out uh, to be part of a specific group, um, uh, normally to uh, guide the affairs of the city, but uh, the New Testament writers selected that word to specifically refer to the church. Same idea, certain ones were called out from among a group, but in this context they are called out to be the disciples of Jesus Christ, to be the, uh, to be the church. Then he goes on to say, grace and peace to be with you. So grace and peace, this is the normal way that the Apostle Paul uses to greet the brethren in other uh, epistles along with this one. The idea is that grace is what you receive, all the spiritual blessings that are contained in Christ Jesus. And we need to understand that Paul you know, um, compresses words. So the word grace, uh, means a, a favor, an unmerited favor, we know all of that, but when Paul is using it, he's compressing all of the favors, all of the gifts that God has given us through faith in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, righteousness, um, uh, 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 eternal life, and so on and so forth. All of these marvelous gifts that we have because we're Christians, he takes all of these and he compresses them down to one word, grace. So when he says grace, he means all of these things together. Then he says you know, grace and peace. Peace 
is what these blessings, forgiveness, adoption, righteousness, so on and so forth, peace is what these things make you feel. Peace is the end result of grace. So I want you to note how Paul puts all of the names when he talks uh, to the Thessalonians, all of the names on an equal footing. You know, he says God and Father and Lord and Jesus and Christ. All of these, perhaps he's mentioning them in a row, but they're all on the same plane. God, of course, the supreme being. Then he mentions Father, Father being the same as God. And in the biblical sense, Father it doesn't refer to maleness. You know, some people object to the word Father being used you know, because somehow uh, you know, it favors men over women. But in the Bible, when the writers are using the term Father, they're talking about the origin of something. Father refers to the origin. God the Father, origin of life, okay? So you have God and then you have the Father and then he says Lord, the Greek word for uh, Jehovah, and then Jesus, uh, the Lord's human name, and then Christ, the title, his title, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. But all of these names are on the same level. It's not God over here and Father and then down here Jesus and so on and so forth. He, he equates God, Father, Lord Jesus and Christ all on the same level of importance. And so Paul begins by putting God and Jesus as equal and himself and co-workers as his readers all in one single unit within the, circle of the, within the circle of the Godhead. We belong to God and because of that, we participate in the Godhead. And so uh, he keeps on going and um, uh, his next um, writing task, objective if you wish, is that he gives thanks. In chapter one, verses two to 10, next section, he goes from his salutation to these people, to the giving of thanks to God because of them. So let's read. It says in, um, in verse two, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. So what Paul is saying that, is that when Paul and the others pray, they give thanks because when they remember the Thessalonians, they remember the things that God has done in their lives. Let's keep reading uh, verse three and four. Uh, he says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. So in, this, uh, in these two verses, Paul describes four things that they remember about these people that causes them, causes Paul and his, his co-workers to give thanks. So first of all, first thing he remembers is their work of faith. He remembers their work of faith and in remembering that, it causes him to give thanks. And so the work of faith, this refers to the things that the Thessalonians did because of their faith. It also confirms that they had the right kind of faith, faith that worked, faith that served, you know, faith that took some kind of action. Because we know that faith uh, that does not work, faith that does not, prove, uh, does not um, produce fruit, uh, is not really uh, a true kind of biblical faith. Then he mentions their, the labor of love. The, the, this signifies and emphasizes the intensity of their work. It was hard work, it was, it was an effort, it caused fatigue as true work often does. It was a labor of love in that those who worked because of faith persevered even when they were tired, even when they you know, had obstacles uh, put in front of them. Uh, they continued to work, they continued to serve because of their love. And so the effort and inconvenience and expense of serving in the church you know, is not given because it's a pleasure, right? It's given because you love and you love because you believe. And Paul is saying, when I think of you, it makes me give thanks. Why? 
because I remember your labor of love, I remember how you persevered in your work, how you did your work, how your faith motivated your work and your love was demonstrated through that work. And so the third thing that Paul recalls that he gives thanks for or, or that provokes him to give thanks is the steadiness of their hope. Steadiness of their hope. Now, um, I, want, I want you to understand there's a difference here. Um, there's a difference between you know, wishing, you know, I wish I could go to Paris, you know, I hope I can go to Paris, and, 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 and biblical hope. You know, a lot of times people say hope, uh, for example, uh, you have a student, uh, he's in the class, he's taking a course in college in history, let's say, American history, but he doesn't read the book, he doesn't do any of the, he doesn't show up for the quick tests, uh, he doesn't memorize any of the important dates. He doesn't uh, you know, uh, get together with his fellow students to study and the exam is now uh, upon him the next day. And he says, wow, I, I, boy, I sure hope I passed this exam, right? Well, what's he doing? He's wishing, you know, it's like a wish, right? Because the odds are not good there. And then you have this other student who's gone to class, taken notes, done the pre-tests, you know, and aced all of those, memorized the important dates, uh, you know, studied his notes, and that student says, well, I, I, I hope I pass the exam. You notice, for one, hope is just wishful thinking. For the other one, hope is confident expectation. I, don't, I haven't written the exam yet, I don't have the result yet, but I have confident hope that I'm going to pass. Why? Well, because I'm, because I'm ready. And so if we're going to bring this idea back to our passage here, uh, they, the Thessalonians, they had hope. They had confident expectation, not just you know, cross my fingers type of hope, or I wish, you know, I hope I go to heaven, I wish I go to, that wasn't their kind of hope. They were confident that God would deliver on His promise of eternal life. Their perseverance in loving service was sparked by their initial faith and it was kept alive by their unswerving hope and confidence in God and His promises. You know, when you, when you lose hope, it's usually a sign that your faith and that your love is, is weak. That's usually where the problem is. So Paul says that all of these things are done in the presence of God who accepts our love but he sees past our loving work to the faith that motivates it. Yeah, he sees what we're doing, but he sees the heart, he sees the motivation. And the motivation is not pride or the, or the desire to you know, uh, 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 be perfect so that we can get to heaven through perfectionism. He sees that our work and our service done in love is motivated by a sincere faith. Because man, man only sees the outside, obviously God sees the inside, and because of this, he guarantees and strengthens our hope of eternal life. And this creates a life-affirming cycle that produces peace and joy in our, in our hearts. And so, you know, to keep in context here, to keep this in context, Paul is saying, when I think about you people, I give thanks to God, why? Because I see your hope I see how strong your hope is in, 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 in the promises of God, and that just makes me rejoice. And then he also gives thanks for one more thing that I mentioned, and that is he, he is thankful for the genuineness of their conversion. Okay, let's take a look at that. Now, in seeing their faith and seeing their hope and their love, Paul is reassured that they are truly chosen of God and loved by God. In other words, when he looks at them and he observes their conduct, he says, now these are God's people. I am, I am confident that these are God's people and it's good to see God's people serving Him. And so we know we are sons of God because of this working faith and this sustaining love and this enduring hope this is how we can know the true from the false. We can tell the difference between, you know, don't we? 
We can tell the difference between who is a sincere Christian and who isn't. We, 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 how? Well, by observing the works of their faith and, and their hope and the way that they express their love. We, we can tell that the Spirit is at work within them. And Paul is also assured of their position with God because of the circumstances surrounding the time when they became Christians. This is important. He's not only confident of their you know, salvation or their genuineness as Christians because he observes their work and he observes their service and their attitude, he's also confident about the legitimacy of their faith because he remembers how they were converted to begin with. And so he knew and he was assuring them that theirs was a genuine conversion uh, and now he, he mentions for four other reasons. Uh, so the fourth reason why he gives thanks uh, gives birth to four other you know, points. And so let's read that in verse five. For example, he knows and he is confident that their conversion is true or is legitimate because, number one, of the message that they heard. He's confident that the message that they originally heard was a message from God. So we read in verse five, this is how he explains this, he says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So Paul and his workers were motivated by the power and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit since it was a vision that initially brought them to Macedonia. Remember? In our last lesson, how did Paul even get to Thessalonica? He didn't want to go there. He wanted to go east. He wanted to go to Asia, right? And he had a vision and the vision told him, no, come this way. And because of that vision, he eventually, he and his co-workers eventually ended up in the city of Thessalonica preaching and establishing the church there. So they knew that it was God's word that they spoke and not man's word like false teachers that were harassing many of the teachers, uh, many of the churches at that time. You know, Paul had had a vision. The spirit was stirred within him. It was the spirit that led him to Thessalonica. And, and, and so he knew that we were in the spirit of God when we came, when we came to you. So the messengers were fully convicted concerning their message that it was truly from God. They had no doubt. Paul had absolutely no doubt that the message he was bringing, and he was bringing them through the inspiration of the Spirit and through the leading of the Spirit, he had absolutely no doubt that this was the right message. That, that their conversion, their initial conversion was based squarely on the work of God. The work of God leading Paul and his his, uh, his workers to the Thessalonians, and also leading Paul to preach the gospel that he had been given uh, by Jesus uh, and, uh, and, and others. So this should be the same criteria for our own salvation. I mean, there's a parallel there today for us. You know, has what we uh, believed come from God or has it come from a man-made religion? Or what gives us the courage to reach out to others? You know, is not the size of our church, but it's the power of our message. You know? Small congregations that, 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 that proclaim the, the biblical message of God are powerful, more powerful than 10,000 member group that is not preaching the gospel correctly or not preaching it, uh, not preaching it uh, at all. And so if it is God's message that we have, then we have all the power that we will ever need to do the work of God uh, here on earth. Another thing that Paul mentions, he says, they knew their conversion was genuine because the messengers, not just the message was godly, but the messengers were also godly. We read that in verse 5b. He says, just as you know, what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And so as I say, not only the message was from God, but the messengers acted in a godly way. The power of the message is regulated by the quality of the messenger. 
right? Isn't that, isn't that the way it works? Imagine, for example, you get in the mail, snail mail we call it today, but let's say you get in the snail mail a lovely card on heavy stock with perhaps a, a ribbon or something there, beautiful, beautiful embossed printing inviting you to a, a, a special occasion of some kind detailing the time and so on and so forth, RSVP card, you know. Or you get an invitation to that thing through your spam mail. You know, which, which, <laughs> which messenger has more credibility? The spam mail email that you got saying, hey, you know, we're having a thing over here, come on out, you're welcome to come out, or the invitation where there was very careful preparation put into it. Not the perfect example, but you understand what I'm saying. You know, the messenger has a lot to do with the credibility of the message. And so Paul is saying here, the apostles had a clear conscience and they acted honorably among the new converts because their message was credible. Their actions uh, uh, um, uh, supported the credibility of uh, their message. And that was important in that day, it's important today, but it was important in that day and time because there were many you know, uh, roving speakers, preachers, philosophers going from place to place, you know, uh, pronouncing all kinds of messages and gospels and so on and so forth. Uh, but their personal conduct uh, was marred by uh, greed uh, for money and, 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 and unholy behavior. So Paul is saying, you know, we know your conversion is true because you know, the message was the right message from God and the messengers themselves conducted themselves as godly, as godly people. You know, sometimes uh, uh, we're not effective in winning others to Christ because our example is interfering with our with our message. If a person doesn't see anything special in you because of Christ, well, why should they believe? You, know, you as the messenger you know, become an impediment to their, to their faith. And of course, I include myself in that in the same way. Paul knew that his conduct was perfectly in line with the message that he preached. So he was confident that they had the right message and they had the right example by the messengers. So uh, another thing he, mes uh, he mentions is they knew their conversion was genuine because the message produced a change. Verse six, let's read that. It says, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So the Thessalonians began imitating the apostles as the apostles were imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? You know, how, how, how did they do this? Well, they were convinced that the message was from God Himself, just as the apostles were convinced when they received it from Jesus. So they improved their conduct. For example, they obeyed the word despite the pressure from the Jews and the pagans around them. And then they maintained a joyful heart despite the hardship and persecution, just like the apostles did. They saw the apostles being pressured to act a certain way. They saw the apostles putting up with uh, 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 persecution and ridicule. They saw the apostles conduct themselves in a, in a, in a, uh, in a proper uh, fashion, uh, morally, uh, uh, you know, they were beyond reproach. And so they began copying the way that the apostles conducted themselves. So the truest proof of sincere conversion to Jesus Christ is a change in lifestyle. I mean, the greater the change, the greater assurance of a full and complete uh, conversion. You know, often we say, if, if you're not any different now than you were before you became a Christian, then you're not really born again, you've merely changed religions. You know, born again means born again. There's something different about you. Lots of people change their religion for whatever reason, but only converted people change their hearts. And that's what the Thessalonians had done. And this is what Paul was, was pointing out. 
Finally, Paul knew and was thankful for their conversion because they themselves became the message. The Thessalonians embodied the message that they had heard from the apostles. In verse seven we read, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and a true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. And so Paul, for a variety of reasons, rejoices and gives thanks whenever he thinks of the Thessalonians. And the last point that he makes about that is that he rejoices and gives thanks because they became the message. They embodied Christ. You know, the, uh, the apostles had no need to speak about this church. The fact that they had responded with enthusiasm and obedience and perseverance was an inspiration to all the believers. As Christians, you know, we not only have the duty to the lost, but we also have a duty to other believers in other congregations to be a light of encouragement. Aren't we encouraged when we see a church doing good deeds, good works? Uh, have you never watched the news and, and on the news for some reason or other there's been a catastrophe of some kind and they're saying uh, 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 the headquarters for the Red Cross and the food distribution is the uh, 10th Street Church of Christ you know, and we interviewed their minister, uh, Minister John Smith or something. Aren't you sitting at home watching that saying yes, that's one of us, he's one of us, there are people proud of them. Well, that, that's what Paul is saying here. The Thessalonians had become a, 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 an object of praise for other congregations. So it's important that other congregations in this area be positively encouraged by what we say and what we do, uh, especially since we've been here for a, a long time. You know, we, it's easy to say the, the, the Choctaw congregation has been here 75 years, you know, but has it been a good influence for 75 years? You know, we must become the voice of God to the lost and a voice of encouragement to the brethren in order to be fully, fully mature. It's one of the the, the big reasons why sometimes churches in a certain area don't grow, because they don't work together. They don't have a good fellowship among the congregations. There's competition. Maybe the preachers don't get along. And so that's a, that, uh, Paul is saying this idea that the Thessalonians were an example to others and an encouragement to others, he was pointing to them as, as a mature group of believers. Okay, so, so let's summarize here the opening section, shall we? Paul is writing to this young church that he has established, and he is rejoicing and giving thanks for them in his opening prayer. And he is thankful because he is sure that they are God's chosen children for, uh, for two main reasons. First of all, he's sure of their conversion. He is sure that they received God's word from God's workers and they received it in a godly way. He sees that their conversion has produced the proper results, a changed lifestyle, hard work in the Lord, faithfulness, hope for heaven, and a loving heart. Many times you know, people run into spiritual trouble because they're not careful about examining their conversion. When people are not taught correctly at the beginning when they are converted, they don't persevere for, for, for very long. So it's okay to examine carefully how a person came to Christ, to make sure that it was done in accordance to God's word and not according to man's religious ideas. You know, you've got to have the basis first. You've got to have a solid base in order to build a Christian life. And then the second thing, uh, Paul rejoices 
because of their growth. Paul is happy because he did his work properly and God is blessing it with a, a rich harvest of faith and hope and love among the people that he worked with, the Thessalonians. This should you know, motivate us to do our work carefully and strictly according to the scriptures when we're studying with other people. Because you know, we'll be judged, not just on our personal conduct, but our work will be judged as well. And I think Paul here was rejoicing that his work was being blessed and they were growing and they were demonstrating uh, mature spirituality because he knew that his work would be judged, his work would be examined, and from what he saw, uh, there was going to be a good result. Now, aside from the relationship between Paul and this church that we see in the opening verses, there's a very practical layout of the, uh, the normal steps of development an individual should go through as he or she matures in Christ. And I'd like to point to, as we close out our lesson uh, this morning, I'd like to point out this, this, this natural, you know, uh, 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 natural steps of spiritual development that all of us should be going through. Okay, so the first step is conversion to imitation, you know, which Paul talks about here. Initial conversion, develops into an effort to imitate our mentors and teachers in Christ. They are the models that we try to emulate as we begin to turn away from our old life and our old mentors and our old examples and we begin turning towards our new life in Christ along with the new mentors, the new teachers, the new encouragers that we try to imitate. So we go from conversion to imitation. All right. Step number two, we go from imitation to example. You know, the constant effort to imitate begins to bear fruit as we slowly change to resemble more and more mature and Christ-like Christians. And so Christians, you know, they look alike, they act in unison, they all go in the same direction. So at some point we stop just imitating and, and it becomes natural for us to be doing this and we ourselves become examples to other people, which leads us to the third step. We go from example to conversion. Our example begins to draw new converts who are now trying to imitate us. And this completes the cycle in our growth from converted to imitation, from imitation to example, from example to conversion. It keeps going round and round, doesn't it? Someone converts us, we learn the truth, we learn how to live, we imitate others to kind of get the feel of how to live as Christians, and pretty soon other people are asking us questions, pretty soon other people are beginning to imitate us, pretty soon other people are being converted because of the example that we gave them, and that's the natural progression of Christian development. And you know, we should ask ourselves, we should also examine ourselves very carefully to see where are we in this progress. And I'm not saying that as a criticism, I'm just saying, you know, where am I in this, in, this, in this process of development? Am I just still at the conversion level, you know, trying to learn the basics? Uh, have I gotten to the point where I'm beginning to imitate and follow what other people are doing? Or has Christian life become natural for me? You know, and I'm beginning to be an example to others. Are, am I asking more questions and am I depending on other people more than other people are asking me questions and depending on me, you know, where am I in this cycle? A good way to kind of review our own personal development in Christ. Well, okay, that's the second lesson in the series um, uh, on First and Second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. I hope you'll be with us for the, for the next lesson in this series. Thank you for your attention.